This is The Interested Interview. I'm your host, JJ Clark. Today I'm discussing the Army Ranger Wing, which is the Special Operations Force of the Irish Defence Forces. To help me with that task is Sergeant Wayne Fitzgerald. He is an active service member of the Irish Defence Forces and co-author of the book Shadow Warriors, the Irish Army Ranger Wing, which is the first and only authoritative account in the public domain of this specialist unit. Now, first off, why was this specialist unit created and when did it happen? Like many special forces, including the SAS, terrorist organisations uh, back in the 60s and, and 70s led to governments forming their own special forces units who could you know, storm buildings, rescue hostages uh, and so forth. So in the, in the late 70s, uh, the Irish Defence Forces had, had ran a few different versions of special forces training for, for normal soldiers. And this led on to the formation of the Defence Forces Army Ranger Wing in March of 1980. And uh, in terms of its, of its history, can you just talk about, I suppose, the name and the Irish name and motto of the Irish Army Ranger Wing? Officially, it's designated as Skiathian Finoglock and Arm. Um, there's no direct uh, English translation for the word phenoglock, so we use the, the internationally recognised designation of ranger. So that would translate as army ranger wing. And that phenoglock word uh, links the positions uh, to Nafina, which is the legendary Irish warriors, which links it with Oglan the Heron, the Irish translation of Irish Defence Forces. Right. And just, I, I'm very interested in the history. So a, a bunch of Irish... Uh, Defence Forces members headed over to uh, Fort Benning in Georgia uh, to receive Green Beret training and it strikes me as uh, the Green Beret is kind of associated with elite like task units with Rambo and when did we get permission to use the Beret as the use the Green Beret itself for our specialist unit? So the Ranger Wing was formed in 1980. Uh, it still took them a year or two to get fully operational. And then the, the Green Beret didn't actually come into play until it was sanctioned in 1986 and, and wasn't officially uh, given out until 1987. There were still a Special Forces unit, but they didn't actually uh, bring in the Green Beret in, until, the mid, until the mid to the uh, 80s. What motivated you to write this book as an active service member? It strikes me as a difficult job for an author to investigate a clandestine unit. Yeah, for the last nine years I've been editor of On Cus and Tor, uh, which is the Defender, the Irish Defence Forces uh, official magazine. And I've been writing about the Ranger Wing for those last number of years. Uh, along with the co-author, Paul O'Brien, who was a contributor to uh, On Cus and Tor, but also uh, uh, an acclaimed author in his own right. So we did a, we did a, a special on the Ranger Wing in, in 2017. And although it was hard to pick and choose what articles could be used, from that, we then saw permission from the Deputy Chief of Staff for Operations um, to, write another, to write a full book. You know, and look to go back and look at the start of how they were formed, um, and to look at all their different um, attributes and skills, and how they were formed, what specialist skills they had, and that led on to writing the book, which took two and a half years. There is a push not to publicly divulge any information on the units, and there's it's kind of sometimes it's looked down upon amongst uh, you know specialist units is was that the case or did you find them open and forthcoming no like like any special force that you've just mentioned it's entire you have you have boundaries um we have to respect those boundaries having been familiar with writing about them and, and how they uh, and how they operate uh we gave them full um opportunity to vet every everything that we wrote so some bits made it to the cutting floor, so, and, and, and hopefully the best bits made it to the book. We didn't go into an awful lot of personalisation. Like we, we, we could name people that were have completely left the Ranger Wing and have retired from, from the forces completely. And they're ones that set up the sniping, set up the parachuting, stuff like that. Um, guys that were the force commanders. So we were able to name 
name those, and we did interview a good few of them, um, but we still didn't put any personalization into it in case they gave away any of the training techniques. Can you talk about the uh, selection process, what's required uh, of uh, the candidates? Yeah. So first of all, um, Ranger Ring selection uh, is now called um, Special Operations Force Qualification, so SOFQ they call it. And it's open to all members of the Defence Forces, whether they be Army, Navy or Air Corps. Um, it's a 36-week modular training course, which has changed in the last few years, where people would become injured. Now they can go back and, and, and come back in at that module, which is a great, uh, it's great for the Ranger Wing to have that, that ability now. So students or candidates would go down on their course, would have to have a high level of physical fitness. They have to have good navigation skills, good mental fitness, personal motivation, uh, and a strong aspiration to serve in the Ranger Wing. As I said, the syllabus is designed to test all aspects of the candidate's character, their military skills, their ability, um, and their general suitability to become a member of the Ranger Wing. So some people will pass the course, but will not actually be accepted as a member of the Ranger Wing. That can happen. When they pass, say, Module 1, 2, and 3, they'll get their Finaldrock badge, and then it's only on, on Modules 4 and 5 of where they go on to specialist training and become operators and get their Green Beret. Uh, and the failure rate is very high. Things that caught my eye were claustrophobia testing and yeah. the water suitability testing. What What are those, uh, just, just for the listener? Um, so Special Forces... Um, Soldiers, when when they're when they're putting in a plan of attack, they have to have used all options. So if they have to crawl through the the, the, the roof space of a building, or they have to crawl under a, a water duct to enter a building, then they don't need to find out then during the operation that people have a, a, a phobia to claustrophobia. So that's why they, they put it into the training, so that people uh, we do it we do it the same for firemen and defence forces, you know, so that they go through all these rigorous trainings scenarios that when they actually do hit, hit an operation or, you know but they're able for it the cross training that happens um, the army ranger wings history is that they learned from other special forces units is that a, still a feature of the training among the army ranger wing to this day yeah you mentioned about them going over to america uh, in the early uh, and the late 70s, they would have done the same with the British SAS. They would have done counter training with those. And everyone that goes away comes back with more skills and more knowledge. So, over the last 40 years of their existence, they've built up this best practice, if you want to call it, uh, of where they've cooperated with other special forces around the world. Yeah, it's still going on on an ongoing basis. I'm interested as well about. Ortiz Hell Week and you featured it uh, in in your magazine and I thought uh, how did that stack up and with the rangers that you spoke to how did it stack up to the actual sele- selection process? Yeah, the TV show was highly acclaimed. It's as, it's as close I think as they can get it without actually endangering the candidates, the civilian candidates. I mean what you see You'd have to imagine that there's only 24, I think 22, 24 candidates in that TV show. In reality, you know, you could have, you know, I know when I went for selection in the mid-90s, there was 90 to 100 on the course. So you can imagine if all of us crammed into a a room, you know what I mean? The same with um, the Ranger Wing now, they're probably getting 50, 60 candidates, you know, and only, you know, when they they go through the certain modules, they're down to, you know, 5 to 10 probably uh, after 36 weeks, you know what I mean? So so it is very high octane. And some of the skills, like people will just hit a brick wall. They just go through so many tests. And then one one just one test will be your brick wall for each candidate, you know what I mean? Right. What did you notice? What were the kind of features of people that that made it look easy? I, I noticed there's uh, the grey man is a... Uh, description of a person who who sort of does doesn't catch any instructor's attention during the selection process, but seems to get by in every task. W- yeah. What kind of characteristics are they screening for for the ideal uh, candidate, and what what gets you through? From from my own experience and from uh, watching uh, over the years, 
mental fitness, like everyone trains, so you can train physical fitness, physical fitness, physical fitness, but mental fitness to, to just allow your body to be battered and bruised and get up and get on with the next task is is where I think it's at, you know what I mean? Mm. Um, I was still playing sports when I went for mine, so although I put in a, a, you know, a training plan, I was still playing sports and I played football on the Saturday and went down on the Sunday and by, by Monday, my body was gone, you know what I mean? So I know myself, mental fitness is a big player on top of the physical fitness. And as you said, the grey man is always the man that will be at the finish line. What comes next? What kind of tactical training, SOF tactics, are Rangers being trained in? What are they learning? Advanced driving skills, marksmanship. What what comes next? So um, Army Ranger Wing Assault Team operators um, would be held in a in a state of readiness 24-7, 365 days of the year. They would be on call for operational command to their command centre within the core attempt. Operators are trained and put into teams and platoons as per their skill set. So their skill set would be, you know, high altitude, low opening parachuting, um, amphibious assault craft training, which would be the maritime teams, fast roping from helicopters, uh, long range marksmanship or sniping, and they would have specialist reconnaissance vehicles, maybe the Ford 350s, soft skin vehicles. So each of those teams would have all their own skill sets within them, so communications, medical, team leader. And that's basically the life of a, of a range wing uh, operator. Interesting. And with that, and you mentioned the Curra camp earlier on, what is TAC Town? And can you talk about the facilities and and sort of what resources are available to the Army Ranger Wing that wouldn't be available perhaps to a regular soldier? That's a hard question to ask, JJ, and, and probably for operational reasons, I probably wouldn't be able to go into it. Okay. Um, so, suffice to say that, you know, the Ranger Wing would have top-of-the-range uh, facilities within their within their compound, um, and they train all over Ireland, you know, so and they train all over the world. So, I mean, they are at the top of their game with, with their equipment and their Facilities. There's a difference between green roles and black roles, I believe, uh, when it comes to rangers. So can you tell us about that, uh, the different roles that a ranger, once qualified, uh, will play? So green role, um, as you call it, would be doing conventional warfare. If there was, if there were to be used in a, in a conventional war, they would be used for um, you know long range patrols, raids, ambushes, uh, sabotage, intelligence gathering, counter insurgencies, those type of specialist tasks. Although we would have other other members of the defence forces trained in recce and trained in um, you know similar roles, uh, the ranger wing would have a, a larger skill set you know and would be able to do it in a, such a smaller team than than a, than a conventional army would. Right. And then the black role would be Specialist Aid to the Civil Power, or ACTP, um, which would include, you know, counter-terrorists, um, hijacking, hostage rescue, airborne, seaborne interventions, close protection of VIPs, subversive threats. You know, that would be the black role that you were talking about. Can you talk about the notable missions of the Army, Army Ranger Wing so far and... For example, Liberia hostage rescue uh, areas where the the unit have clad themselves in in sort of I suppose esteem and 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 have, have brought brought a good reputation to the Irish special forces. Well, as you know, um, at home they would have been doing um, close protection and stuff for for HM Queen Elizabeth II, the visit of uh, U.S. President Donald Trump and Vice President Michael Pence in June and September of last year. And then, you know, the Defence Force itself has a record of 62 years of unbroken UN peacekeeping service since 1958, where individual members of the Ranger Wing would have served overseas. But as a unit overseas, they would have cut their teeth in Somalia in, in September of 93, which is, was just before the infamous uh, Black Hawk Down incident uh, in October 93, where 18 US Rangers were killed, uh, who were operating independently of the UN at the time. From there, the, the ARW 
served as a mission entry force to missions such as East Timor in 99, Liberia in 2003, Chad 2008, up to their present mission in Mali uh, since September 2019. And just to give you an idea, so the, the UN's MINUSMA mission uh, is considered by security experts as the most dangerous. Since July of 2013, uh, 216 MINUSMA peacekeepers and law enforcement uh, personnel who are on the ground in Mali have been killed. And, and over 360 have been seriously injured. Uh, and that's as of May 2020. So that's, that's up to date. Uh, in February of this year, three Irish uh, Ranger Wing uh, soft operators were suffer, suffered minor injuries when an improvised explosive device, which is an IED, detonated near their, their vehicle while they were out on patrol in eastern Mali. So we're there. The, the, these guys are in the, in the, in the cut of it, operating at such a high level. You mentioned the EU battle group. So there's ARW operatives at the moment currently training for the UN-approved German-led EU battle group. And that will be due to go on stand, operational standby uh, for six months very soon. If the battle group was called into action, uh, the Irish contingent would need to be deployed with the Irish government's triple lock authorization. Uh, and to date, no EU battle group has been deployed. So it's like a sta- it's like having an insurance policy, and, and they're ready there to be used within the EU if needed. Can you just, uh, just for the listener, the, uh, triple lock, what does that mean? The mission would have to have a UN mandate, and then the government uh, and the doll would all have to approve it. So, that, so that's the three three reasons that unlock the mission to allow them to right. be put, on, put on the ground. To mobilise that group, say, for example, ARW were on a standby for a EU battle group, uh, what are we talking uh, an international terror incident, or what? What are we talking about when we when we say it they'd would be on normally standby? be uh, something on the ground in a country where uh, you know peacekeepers were were needed immediately. So if you imagine it, you know it would have to go to the UN Security Council, have to be discussed. You know it could take weeks. Whereas if you already have a battle group trained, have trained together, and are, are are actually just on standby within barracks around. The, whatever the troop contributing nations are, they can be put on the ground probably within hours. And so if there was a, you know, peacekeepers needed to separate, let's say it was the UN mission in Cyprus, um, and it needed to be backfilled with more troops, well, then that, that EU battle group could be, you know, mobilised and sent there within hours. Fantastic. And could you explain aid to civil power and then, I suppose, the Army Ranger Wing's role in that? Um, aid to civil power basically means that the Angarda Shia Khan would have to request the defence forces on the ground uh, in addition to support them. Um, so, like in recent days, there, you know, members of the defence force were called out to help search uh, with Angarda Shia Khan. So, that's an aid to civil power matter. If a bomb went off in the city centre and uh, the bomb squad, the army bomb squad was called out, that's an aid to civil power matter. Where they're given aid, uh, you know, specialist aid to the Angarda Shia Khan. Uh, and as such, certain tasks, like, uh, as you said, hostage situation, terrorist situation, rather than look for uh, normal units, the, the request would be for Army Ranger Wing personnel, um, where they would send their team. You know what I mean? Yeah. Um, and can you talk about counter terrorism and how prepared the Army Ranger Wing are? and how uh, they sit hand in glove with the emergency response unit ready for an uh, an incident f- uh, and, and maybe the exercises that have taken place uh, to prepare the forces. Yeah, like I mentioned before, um, you would have teams and platoons of uh, ranger wing operatives for their specific roles. So counter-terrorism would be one of those roles. Um, and they would be on standby 24-7, 365 days, on call to the operational command and the defence forces. So if a call did come in, they could be dispatched within within an hour, probably. You know, helicopters would come down from Baldono, pick them up, and they'd be dropped to wherever, they, wherever, they, wherever they're needed. Or they would, you know, use their own mode of transport. The, the last uh, exercise that I'm familiar with would be uh, Exercise Ulf, which is, as you said, prepared which was the largest scale um, military on Garnashia Khan exercise that was conducted in December to 2017, which had many different aspects of the defence forces with on Garnashia Khan for a terrorist incident. You know what I mean? And I'm sure there's, there's been some uh, since then that I just haven't reported on. Just for young, new 
recruits who 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 want to get into uh, the life of a uh, of an army ranger and want to receive the green beret what advice would you give that young recruit going into the whole process as i mentioned earlier uh, training 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 i mean most you know, most soldiers in the in the defence force when they train receive you know up to six months of military training. So, you know, a good few candidates will do their six months training and then go straight for the army ranger wing. You know, what I mean? because it's 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 like a, a layered system. You know what I mean? Um, in my case, I was five years in. You know, in some places it's probably ten, fifteen years where people are you know a seasoned soldiers have been overseas, have done missions. And are then going for their for their for that experience, you know, to take it to the next level. There is a chapter in the book all about training and, and what is expected of the training, and it breaks down the modules, you know, into smaller chunks. But I would highly emphasise mental fitness as well as the physical fitness. You know, uh, putting yourself under pressure is, is where you're going to find you, you'll need mental strength. The army and the defence forces and probably to more of an extreme, the Army Ranger Wing, they teach leadership and teach young soldiers how to be leaders. Is this a, is this a case? And, and, and how do they do that? How do they foster, you know, strong leadership? Because when you have, like, bullets flying at you or you have loud noises or you have an aggressive enemy, these kind of things require good leadership. Yeah, it would all stem from their initial recruit training where they're broken down into sections. So you would have a section commander, uh, you'd have a section 2 IC, and then you would have, you know, when you're training as a section, you would always have your, your lead scout who, that if, if, you know, if someone was taken out, you know, that the roles would, would, would similar step back. Uh, and that just develops all the way through. So you go to a platoon level where you'd have three sections with a platoon commander and a sergeant. And then you would go to uh, company level, which would have three platoons. So all the time you're building on your leadership, all the time. Someone can always take over. The Ranger Wing would operate in teams. So they would have teams, you know, like a section would have nine to 10, 11 men in it, whereas a, a team would probably have four to six men in it. So the Ranger Wing are operating at such a, you know, such a smaller uh, combined team compared to a, a, a conventional section or platoon. Uh, and that's where leadership is just built from the ground right up. We call it, you know, uh, from the corporal, we call it the strategic corporal on the ground, you know, where he, he, he'll learn what a sergeant's role is, that if he has to step up, and the same way a sergeant can step down and, and lead a team if he if needs be. What kind of grasp of the Irish language is, is given to new recruits, and, and is that important to leadership and and down all the way to the new recruits that you should know Irish and, and you're part of the Irish Defence Forces and and you should be proud and, and that that kind of thing. Yeah, you, you've just said it there. You don't need an awful lot of grasp on the Irish language. When you join, certain words of command are done in Irish. Um, in tactics, it's probably done all in English. But, but in ceremonial on the square, it would be done in, in Irish. But it's like any drill. You know, if you, if you learn the drill, you'll learn the words of command and they'll just become natural. It's ingrained in you all, all the way through your, your career. Speaking Irish, you may have to hand over, uh, you know, to a dignitary and you'll learn, you learn the little screed in Irish probably as well. You know what I mean? You, 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 you pick up bits. I mean, the manual is, all manuals are, are done in, in, in bilingual, so they're English and Irish. Then just basic tactics when you come into the army. Cover and move seems to be the fundamental tactic for um contemporary warfare is this is this a function of the irish army i know i know the american army uh put it into practice a lot in in urban warfare is is cover and move a, a feature is that taught at a at an early yeah. stage yeah, it's one of the basics that you would learn as a soldier yeah yeah how to work in teams that you're not crossing over someone else's fire yeah so you would always do leaps and bounds and 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 cover you know, even in a section, they would break down into, into smaller two-man teams where you're you're leaping and bounding, you know, covering, concealing in, in, in teams as small, as small as you know, two two people. And just to sort of wrap up, you've you've had a, a long career and you're you're still an acting uh, service member of the Irish Defence Forces. If you, I think that a lot of the army experience is about discipline. It's about working in a team. It's about clear comms communication and. I think 
all these features and, and, and good leadership and teaching teaching young recruits how to be good leaders do you, if you could institute any of the practices that are taught in in the Irish army into primary school uh, what would they be what would what would fe- what features do you think should be taught to younger people uh, from the army lessons from the army so to speak that's a tough one um especially being a father. I suppose, uh, as you said, the discipline, I mean, getting up every day, making a bed, you know, having clean clothes, being being washed and smart, being punctual. I mean, they're all the, uh, the attributes that are instilled in recruits from day one. And, and most get it. Like, I mean, um, you know, you won't find, you know, you won't be late a lot of times. You might be late once or twice. Uh, and the same, you might come down, you know, in a messy uniform once, you probably won't do it again because, Corrective punishment could be, you know, put on the whole platoon. You know what I mean? So you'll work as a team. So if you see a fellow that has a, you know, his barrette is not right, you'll tell him. You know what I mean? If you see his, his button is open, you'll tell him. And that's why they do the buddy-buddy system, you know. Any form of boot camp that can be brought in would, would, would benefit young people, you know what I mean? Especially teenagers. And just on creativity and decentralised command... I think there's a there's an image put out there that if you have a team and you're in a, in the army and say for example you you're the leader of a team you, what you says goes and even if it's a bad idea it won't be questioned but I don't think that's the case and I think that in the army you're actually taught to question your leadership if it's a bad decision and and that cre- creativity is kind of it's encouraged in the army is it is this the case I mean, any good leader would ask, you know, one or two of his senior men, you know, this is what I'm planning to do with it, you know. And a good leader would always, you know, look to left and right and, and take advice. And yeah. Seek advice and seek advice from above. Sergeant Wayne Fitzgerald, active service member in the Irish Defence Forces and author of the book Shadow Warriors, the Irish Army Ranger Wing. Thank you very much for joining me. Thanks very much, JJ. It was a pleasure.